So I feel like you don't actually ever understand a model truly until you see its assumptions. And from the assumptions, you can see actually, you know, how credible is the model, is the theory. So in this video, I want to go over 11 assumptions of the Haradoma model and assess the model on the basis of these assumptions. So the first one is it assumes that there is a direct relationship between capital stock and GDP. And thus, that's why it builds on that any new additions cause an increase in output. But how true is it that capital stock and GDP are directly related? The evidence is mixed. So on these grounds, I'm not sure if this assumption is wrong completely because the results of this when you look at empirical data depends on what you read and how you read are mixed but if it was absolutely no this theory could not exist because it's on the assumption that there is a direct relationship the second assumption is that there's unemployed labor like the lewis theory um, they say that there's, there's unlimited supply of labor how true is that because in many developing countries we don't take into account the informal sector and so many people live and work in the informal sector. That is a type of employment. The third assumption is that production is proportional to the stock of machinery. How true is that? Again, doesn't labor play a bigger role than machinery when it comes to production? The fourth assumption is that the Harvard Doma model assumes that savings and investments are all that is needed to generate growth because it's a circle, it's a cycle, a virtuous cycle which we can, you know, inject and start off in developing countries. But the problem is in reality there's several compl uh, compl uh, complicated factors involved. For example, you need to have an educated workforce who can use the capital machinery once you change it. You need a growth in infrastructure, roads, water, electricity. And as we'll see later, that this model assumes that there's no government activity. So who is producing the infrastructure? infrastructure? And further to this point, I want to add that institutional factors have been assumed in the Haradoma model. But in reality, when you're looking at economic development, in these developing countries, they don't have these institutions such as the legal infrastructure or as, um, you know, North, what does he call them? Uh, I can't remember, players of the game, that's it. And then you have the rules of the game. If you don't have these, then, you know, really, how can we just say that growth is so easy like that? So that's another assumption where it falls short of matching up to reality. The fifth assumption is that implicit in the Haradoma model is that there's no diminishing returns to capital because you just accumulate capital and that increases growth. There's no such thing as that over time this accumulation is going to have diminishing returns. That's not realistic. Everything has diminishing returns and everything you reach a point where from there you've literally had too much and it goes downhill. So I don't think this is a good assumption either. The sixth assumption is that the model starts from a full employment level of income, but such a level is not found in underdeveloped countries. There exists disguised, uh, disguised un uh, unemployment in such countries which cannot be removed by the methods suggested by Harrod and Doma. Thus, the main assumption of the model is absent in underdeveloped countries. It's not applicable to them. How do you work with uh, an assumption that's not like... I, I'm just struggling to see how the Harrod Doma model is actually useful to developing countries when the assumptions just don't match up to reality. My only explanation for this is the model was actually uh, designed to explain the growth in developed countries, which this model seems more apt and adequate to. The fact that we're trying to replicate it and enforce it onto developing countries I think it's problematic because, again, now we're going to look at the seventh assumption that the Haradoma model um, is based on no government uh, intervention, what I was saying earlier in economic activities. This is not applicable because in developing countries they have governments and they play the largest role. They are the people sparing investment, getting private funding, foreign aid. They are a really crucial part of development and they just simply are ignored in the Haradoma model. The eighth assumption is that it's a closed economy. But the thing is, nowadays, bar like, I think, North Korea, most of developed countries, 
they are open and they want to grow, especially when we had that, you know, whole thing that um, ISI failed and, you know, we really want to push export-led growth. People see China's export-led growth. They think, oh, that's I'm getting rid of trade barriers. That's what the reality is. But this model is saying, actually, reality is, you know, underdeveloped um, um, countries are closed. We should open them and allow them to trade. It's not really realistic, is it? The ninth assumption um, is that, again, the model was based on an unrealistic assumption of a constant price level. But in underdeveloped countries, prices change are inevitable with development and they're more volatile. Just look at Zimbabwe, which is, um, you know, the most extreme example with the hyperinflation. Price levels are not constant and they're not predictable either in developed countries. They're volatile. This is a generalization, but again, you know, we can't base our growth strategy on something which is so incompatible with developing countries. Uh, the 10th reason is that capital um, depreciation and gestation lags, they break the equation that savings equal investment. Actually, saving can't equal investment because, you know, investments got many more costs attached to it, like capital depreciation. If that fails, then the whole mathematical formula for the Harrod-Domar model absolutely fails. And therefore, it cannot be true, because remember, when we did the mathematical model, there were four mathematical um, identities, assumptions that we used to formulate the last one, which is that changes in growth are jointly determined by uh, capital ratio and the savings ratio. But um, if the assumptions are broken, we can't say that that final concluding formula is correct either. And finally, it's difficult to define the determinants of the savings rate. There's no perfect policy just saying that we need to increase the savings rate. What do we do? Do we increase, um, you know, interest rates? But then you're left with the dilemma that actually we need to improve productivity and investment rates and putting up interest rates, you're going to reduce that. So what do you do? It's not very beneficial in terms of policy implications either. I'm not sure this model is at all appropriate when it comes to um, developing countries, mainly because it was initially designed for developed countries to explain their growth. Just simply putting it onto developing countries, it does not work. And the way we see this is that we can evaluate the model by saying that actually, basically all the assumptions that it makes are false or just, you know, largely untrue. Um, I hope this video helps. Please visit my blog.